Hello all and welcome to today's event hosted by the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard University. The mission of the Institute is to engage through interdisciplinary research to advance and deepen the understanding of critical issues relevant to South Asia and its relationship with the world. I'm Chelsea Farrell, the Acting Executive Director, and I'm pleased to tell you a little bit about the thriving arts program that we currently have at the Institute. This program bridges South Asia's artistic world with the intellectual and creative resources of Harvard University. Made possible by generous funding from the Donald T. Reagan Lecture Fund, as well as a number of our generous donors, the program offers visiting artist fellowships, the program on conservation of culture, the new Distinguished Artist Fellowship, and numerous art conferences and workshops each year. Sneha Shrestha has been the arts program manager at the Mittal Institute for the past four years. She manages our visiting artists and distinguished artist fellowships. Sneha is a graduate of the Harvard Graduate School of Education and an accomplished artist herself working in paintings and murals. Thank you, Sneha. Thank you, Chelsea. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sneha Shrestha. I'm the arts program manager at the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard University. Uh, welcome to the opening of Women in South Asia, Expectations, Burdens, and Obligations. This is an art exhibition with the works of the current visiting artist fellows, Bunu Dungana from Nepal and Pragati Dalvi Jain from India. We will begin the event with presentations by the visiting artist fellows, and this will be followed by an online conversation between the artists and Professor Gina Kim. Professor Gina Kim is the George P. Bigford Professor of Indian and South Asian Art at Harvard University. Her research explores diverse topics such as the female patronage of Buddhist art in medieval South Asia, the development of visual vernaculars in Indian manuscript painting, and a complex history of reappropriation of a religious site like Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Her first book, Receptacle of the Sacred, Illustrated Manuscripts and the Buddhist Cult in South Asia was published by the University of California Press in 2013. Her second book, also with the UC Press, Garland of Visions, Color, Tantra, and a Material History of Indian Painting will be available coming February. In addition to her academic research, she is working on a digital humanities project on color, mapping color in history which will serve as an online portal and a searchable open database for existing and future research on pigments. Professor Kim co-curated an exhibition on Nepalese Buddhist ritual art and co-edited its catalog, Dharma and Punya, Buddhist Ritual Art of Nepal. She is also the faculty director of the arts program at the Mittal Institute. Professor Kim, thank you so much for being here today. I would like to announce a couple of housekeeping points before we begin. Um, at the end, we'll have a question and answer session where the audience will be able to submit questions directly to the panelists via the Q&A function on Zoom. Due to the large number of attendees tonight, we unfortunately may not be able to cover all the questions, but we'll try our best. Also note that today's session will be recorded. And without further ado, here's Professor Gina Kim. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Good evening, everyone. Um, oh, and thank you, Snea, for <laughs> that generous introduction. Uh, so thank you all for joining us for the Visiting Artist Exhibition opening event uh, this evening. So as you all heard already, this is uh, this event is part of the Arts at the Middle Institute's Visiting Artist Program. And I'd like to start by sort of giving you a little bit of background on how the program came about. So the Visiting Artist Program began about six years ago, or over six, uh, well, five, six years ago, we welcomed our first cohort in for 2015, but its seed for development started over uh, seven years ago when uh, the, the then South Asia Institute, now Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute, Asia Institute convened a gathering of faculty across campus to discuss the importance of art and understanding and educate educating about South Asia and also in South Asia to foster civic engagement. And that meeting identified uh, a few strategic areas of focus, one of which is this visiting artist program that would bring artists from South Asia to campus for immersive experience with no strings attached. 
So this program is made possible through a lot of different fundings, in, uh, most importantly from through the generous funding from the Arts Advisory Council of the Lakshmito and Family South Asian Institute. The Arts Advisory Council is chaired by Dr. Dipti Matur with council members from different parts of South Asia, uh, the UK, the US, who share the mission of supporting the development, preservation, and promotion of arts of South Asia in the global stage. So this program is designed to provide a pr precious opportunity for Harvard's community to engage with artists from South Asia and learn from diverse perspectives that the artists bring. In turn, South Asia-based artists who are selected for fellowships have a rare opportunity to engage with the academic community at Harvard and in its intellectual and cultural resources. The aim is to really create a channel for communication and interactions that would inspire both the members of the Harvard community and the artists coming from South Asia. And during their time at Harvard, artists get to audit classes and engage with faculty with whom the research and artistic interests align. And so artists get to access the, also the library and the museums in the area. And so there are amazing resources for artists whose practices uh, usually require the research. And I think our program still has this aspect of civic engagement in artistic practices as one of the pillars or hallmarks, you can say, often our visiting artists directly engage with pressing social, political, cultural, environmental issues and uh, through artists, uh, innovative artistic means and methods. So we usually host two artists from South Asia per semester for two months, but last year due to the pandemic, we couldn't host any artists in Cambridge here. So in, in its stead, we selected a cohort of 13 artists from all over South Asia for a virtual fellowship, and we ran virtual seminars with Harvard faculty throughout the year. As we're gradually opening campus and we're able to select two artists from last year's cohort to come to campus as a visiting artist fellow this semester. So um, after today's event, and I, I hope you will have a chance to actually visit the exhibition yourself and also remind you to look for our artists, although all masked up often, and uh, identify them and say hello when you see them and start conversing and connecting with them when you see them next. And um, this evening is a chance to hear from the artists about their own works. And I can't thank you, thank Snea enough, Snea Shrestha, the amazing coordinator for the arts program, who's been really tirelessly working uh, to make this possible, make sure the program runs smoothly, guiding also once, once they arrive, until they arrive, and once they arrive, I think guiding artists in their day-to-day -day navigation of the Harvard campus life, which can be really daunting for anyone. And I would also like to thank the staff of the uh, Lakshmi South Asia Institute, especially Chelsea and Selman for putting together this event. So today it is my great pleasure to introduce our two visiting artists, Bunu Dungana and, and Pragati Talvi. So Bunu Dungana is an artist based in Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, Bunu uses photography as a medium to explore and question the world around her. Her background in sociology so informs her uh, photographic work questioning notions of gender and patriarchy. While, uh, while her personal projects center around gender, she has worked in a wide range of fields from visual ethnography, NGO um, work to commercial and journalistic work. And uh, Bunu actually earned her MA in sociology from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi and started photography professionally only in her early 30s. Uh, but it's she has participated in numerous workshops, photography workshops, both in Nepal and in other international locations. And I realize she's also active as uh, a mentor and convener of photography workshops in Nepal, educating next generations of photographers. And I was delighted to see the name of our previous visiting artist fellow, Sagar Chatri, as co-mentor for a program for introduction to visual storytelling. Her work has been exhibited in Photo Camp Kathmandu, uh, Chovi Mela, Hong Kong International Photo Festival, Isharaf Art Foundation, to name but a few. She is associated with Photo Circle and Nepal Picture Library in Kathmandu. And I was so delighted to see she also aspires to uh, make films. Through her work, she shares her personal stories about being a woman in a deeply patriarchal Hindu society. And I think the works on display in the exhibition relate to this important theme that she's exploring and we'll hear more about. I'll introduce our next uh, artist, Pragati Dalvi Jain, comes to us from Bangalore, uh, India. Pragati received her BFA and MFA in painting from the prestigious Sir JJ School of Art in Mumbai. 
I mean, if you say JJ School of Art, you know this is a pre pre prestigious school. It's you know over 200 years um, old school. Pragati has shown her work at the United uh, Untitled Art Fair in New, New Delhi, and her, her works are held in the private collections in London, Switzerland, Germany, California, and India. And she's a recipient of numerous awards, both domestic and international, including the first prize for the Pratyagati ex exhibition organized by Futur Foundation Switzerland in 2017. Although her artistic training was focused on painting, she has moved on to diversify her artistic medium to photography, performance, and video. In her performances, she shares concern about modern living, loss, uncertainty, the temporary net nature of life, strength, and fragility. As an artist, she pursues questions relating to the issue of connection and disconnection in contemporary society, how emotional experience is shared with another, what it means to be human in the modern urban world, what it means to be a woman in 21st century India. And uh, this is also like really kind of in interesting detail here. As a mother of two herself, she firmly firmly believes that art is the way forward for um, kids to have a more, more liberal and progressive society. And this is one of the reasons why she has moved towards performance and public art to reach wider audience. And the work displayed in the exhibition precisely reflect this concern and we'll hear about um, this aspect of her work as well tonight. So without further ado, who's the, I think we're going to, I think hear from both artists, I think taking turns, I, I guess. So we'll start with Bunu. Yeah. Is that how we're going to go? Yes, Bunu and then we, we start with Pragati. Mm -hmm. You will start yeah. with Pragati? Okay, great. So we'll start with Pragati. Thank you, Gina. Thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you, Mithil Institute, for having us here. It's really unbelievable. Cool. Let's begin. How much does memory of an experience alter from the time of experience to the time of remembrance? How long and how many times do we travel back and forth between what we are and the way others perceive us? And how much do we save of ourselves in these transitions, internal and external? My body now is a residue of all my experiences and each day it gets more consolidated. Yes, I'm not only a woman with flesh and blood, but also an accumulation of infinite possibilities underneath. Meet me without any prejudice. Here I am depicting the various layers of being a woman in urban India. Their journeys and struggles to locate themselves as individuals, in the complex web of social boundaries and so-called freedom. The performance of writing the word bachao, which means save, inhabiting a place of misery, of being unheard, yet not losing hope. It reflects an experience that the body and the mind goes through where each moment is a desperate cry for help. All the while, we care less and pay less attention. In 2020, as the world collectively experienced isolation, I experienced noise. I read about Priyanka Reddy back in 2019, a 26-year-old doctor from Hyderabad who was brutally gang raped and burned alive. It took me a year to hear her voice that got lost in the materialness, maybe. I was waiting for some kind of seclusion to hear her. I performed No One Is Listening but Chow on a less crowded street in Bangalore. I kept writing over the same word till it became distinctly visible. Here is a 20 second glimpse of the performance.
During the first 10 minutes of the performance, I felt overwhelmed by the sounds in the distance. I was uncomfortable with the darkness in spite of the two men accompanying me to help me with the documentation. The fear and the uncertainty that came over me, it made me question, what makes us feel safe in the society we live in? How long does one have to live with the fear of being attacked psychologically and physically? As I kept writing and writing for 45 minutes with my nails rubbing against the hard wall, the cold rain numbed my mind. My body took over, pushing me to tears while the headlight of the car kept blinking and I could not run away from the trauma of being trapped. And so did Priyanka, until she was dead. How close is close enough? This piece is about personal space, or you call breathing space, that is constantly compromised under patriarchal and political idiosyncrasies. The confined space restricts movement, restrain any activity, well, such as the power of outdated ideologies, which hold the individual hostage to immobility and progress. The adjustment confines not only to an individual's physical space, but also their psychological space intervened by such conventional beliefs. Then we five women, including me, enclosed ourselves in a six feet cross three feet cross three feet box of 45 minutes, our bodies touched each other, closing the gap of years of discrimination around casteism and gender roles, at least literary and temporary. In the glass box, a 35 year old household help stood close, drenched in a sweat with her employer. A 43 year old mother stood with her 14 year old daughter. And we all stood crammed against the moving people on either side of the acrylic box. As the onlookers gazed at our plight in our space, we returned their gaze, coping uncomfortably, but silently. This is a series of photographs of ordinary people in which each image depicts the view of an individual whose pursuit is to break free of the stereotypical typical adhesives. I interacted and photographed nearly 100 people with the statement, I am more than a reflection of my mother. And I'm more than a name. I'm more than my religion. I'm more than my sex, written on their bodies. The purpose was to have a face that stands in for the statement and has tolerated the burden of prejudice at various places. It made apparent their need to be seen as human first, rather than being crucified for caste or religion or sex and its prohibitions. It was in 2018 when my son was born. I named him Zikr, an Arabic word for remembrance. I believed he would grow up in a world where his actions would matter and not the religious origin of his name. But in 2020, during the riots in Delhi, 38 people were killed because of their Muslim sounding names. I was advised to change my son's Zikra name to a more Hindu sounding name for his safety. On the other hand, I saw my Muslim friends feeling the need to reiterate their identities. All I wanted to do was talk about the identity crisis nesting among men and women of progressive India. A dilemma that forces us to question who we are, where we belong, and what we should hide or reveal to be accepted by society and tosses us in a hustle regarding what we want and what is expected of us. It was a difficult thing to
to come to terms with our ideals and the realities of hate that surround us. I knew I must do something. I end this presentation with what artist Lee Lozano left for us to contemplate. I have no identity. I have an approximate mathematical identity. I have several names. I will be human first. Identity is a vector. Identity changes continuously as multiplied by time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presence, listening to me. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, Bunu? Yeah. Thank you, Pragati, for your insightful presentation. And thank you, everyone at the Middle Institute for having us. Uh, I'm going to present my work, work confrontation and the process of making the work. Uh, next slide. Confrontations came out of my lived experience of being a woman in a deeply patriarchal Hindu society in Nepal. In retrospect, I feel the work was brewing inside me for a very long time. Growing up, I was always reminded that I'm a girl and I have to behave in a certain way, and I hated it. As I grew older, these rules and regulations kept getting more rigid. Don't laugh out loud. Don't wear this. Don't do this. The list kept getting long longer and longer. As I was expected to transition from a daughter to a wife and eventually a mother, um, I'm so sorry, I think the light went off. Uh, can I, what do I do? <laughs> oh, Budu, best thing would be to, uh, if you want to take a second just to turn on the light switch or if you want to continue as you are, it's up to you, but uh, no worries. Oh, okay. I think I'll just continue. Um, as I was expected to transition from a daughter to a wife and eventually a mother, it felt as if I was incomplete if I didn't play these roles and that I had no other identity whatsoever. The questions and comments like, why aren't you married yet? You're 36 now, don't you think it's time to marry? One should have babies before 35. You should not miss out on being a mother. It's such a special feeling. You don't have to get married, but please find a partner. Feminists don't marry, no? If you don't marry, you'll die alone. You must have so much fun being single. I'm jealous of your freedom. you agreeing. Came my way wherever I went. It was towards the end of 2016, confrontation started taking shape. I did a collaborative photo work with a widowed woman and recreated different phases of her, of her life as she transitioned from a bride to a wife and then to a widow. However, I felt that my voice was more dominant in the work than her story. This was the first time I started thinking about colors, especially red and white, and their relationship to married and widowed Hindu women. This was like a revelation of sorts. Red is so prevalent around me that I'd almost taken it for granted. And I was already experimenting with self-portraits on the side. So I decided to be my own subject for the lack of a better word. Red is significant in a Nepali woman's life. It indicates marital status, symbolizes auspiciousness, sexuality, fertility, and life. I use gender markers of married in the women in the, in the series to question what it means to be a woman. For instance, here, before I made this photo, I initially put one bindi that marks the married woman. And while I was doing this, I thought, what if I put the bindi all over my face, what would that mean? Uh, I feel this photograph is representative of how patriarchy wants women to be, and yet I feel I'm subverting in some ways. In this photo too, first I put the veil normally and in the process thought of wrapping it around my neck. I feel a certain kind of suffocation being a woman. It's as if I'm strangulated by society and its expectations. So color red helped me discover what it means to be a woman in my society. I never knew a color could be this political. Confrontation is about my experience of being an unmarried woman, my experience with menstruation, my experience with my body and violence. My work rebels against the deeply embedded structures of patriarchy where women are supposed to keep their lives under wraps and live in shame and stigma. It's a fight to be myself. As I was making the self-portrait series, 
I thought I could experiment more with color red. So the next very obvious step was menstrual blood, which is considered impure and dirty. I had to rigidly follow menstrual tabs at home. When I was making this work, I threw up when I opened a sanitary napkin with menstrual blood. When I'm making work, it's a very instinctual process and I keep experimenting if and when I have a thought or an idea. For, in, for, for instance, when I was working with menstrual blood in between, uh, next slide. Uh, I had gone trekking and was looking at the beautiful Nepali landscape and I had an idea of using menstrual blood on the photos. What would that mean? I'm still in the process of developing this part of the work. When I started working with blood and landscape, the idea of body and how I wanted to photograph it came to me while I was experimenting with the camera. When I saw the photographs, I felt the body resembled blood. But when I was making it, it started with the question, does this body uh, even belong to me? Also, if this body defines who I am, what if I try to undefine it? What would that mean? Trying to go beyond the essentialist view of the body. Like I mentioned before, my work is a, a lot about experimentation and trying to see what happens if I do this. What, if, what happens if I try that? As I was developing the work and the question of being a woman, I had to include my mother because she's the closest woman in my life and she comes from a different generation. She had a certain expectations of me and our relationship was defined by conflict. Of course, there's also love. So I wanted to start a conversation with my mother and I told her to write a letter to me about the things she wanted to tell me. I also realized that there wasn't just a photo of the two of us, apart from two photos from my childhood. So this was also an experiment to see how we would be in front of the camera together in the same frame. As I was making this work, I thought, what if I become my mother by wearing her clothes? For me, photography is also a medium of inquiry, mostly through experimentation. So this is the letter uh, she wrote to me. Uh, in my work, I uh, play it in a video loop. Uh, I'll play a small part of the letter. <laughs> प्यारी छोरी बुनु सुवाशिष था धेरै समय देखि तिमीलाई के भनु वा लेखौ भन्ने कुराले मनमा उकुस मुकुस भइरहेको थियो अ सो हियर शी सेज आई वांट टु सिट विथ यू टॉक टु यू पोर आउट माय हार्ट टु यू बट यू कन्स्टन्टली ट्राई टु रन अवे फ्रॉम मी आई सी दैट यू आर एब्सोल्युटली अनविलिंग टु लिसन टु एनीथिंग आई हैव टु से टेल मी हैव आई रियली बिकम अ हेल्पलेस मदर Our relationship reminds me of my mother. She taught us discipline, dignity, and wise conduct. When I was my mother's daughter, and when I am a daughter's mother, oh, what a vast difference! I always tried to heed to my mother's instructions, tried to imbibe them. You are absolutely the opposite. It is said that a mother is the best friend a daughter can have, but I couldn't become a good friend for you, and you know the reason better than I can explain here. Sometimes I wonder if you aren't really stubborn and self-centered. So this process also made me realize that not only we didn't have a photo together, we actually hadn't sat and had a conversation with each other. Uh, I also have a part of work which is all about my conversation with my mother, um, and it's an ongoing um, conversation. Next slide. Uh, I also work with text. I think text can be visuals too, and they add another layer to the work. Uh, I'll just read out a small part. Uh, I cried so much when my niece Katha was born. I have never been happier. I hope she grows up to be a strong and independent woman. I know she will. She has a mind of her own. She is now 15 months old. Last Dasai, which is a festival, an uncle said, "We can't let Bunu influence Katha." I asked him what he meant. He went quiet. Uh, last but not the least, I'm ending my presentation with these self portraits I took last year. I feel the work is starting to get repetitive. Am I just trying to see the same thing in a different way, or same thing in the same way? Though I am very aware that repetition is very important to my work, repetition is about emphasizing, and I cannot emphasize enough. It's also about creating a rhythm and a buildup. We are now in 2021, and it's ending very soon. And I don't know where the work will go. To be very honest, the more I see the world around me, the more I notice how gendered it is. How I behave is so gendered. It's a strange feeling to realize how patriarchal I could get as a woman too. I think there's a lot to think through and to rework on. 
Uh, my work is a process. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Bunu. Thank you both for these powerful, beautiful presentations. Uh, I'm so moved. And I've, I can't believe I just went up to see the works, but didn't see you were all there. So <laughs> I missed my chance to just greet in person, although we uh, did meet uh, briefly. Okay, well, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, both of your work really addresses the issue of gender and and sort of the, but it, it, it comes from very personal place. Buna in particular, you're really exploring the very personal experience and and it can't be easy to be sort of dealing with the very personal issues or how you actually see like social problems and express it. I mean, I think you, both of you are very brave. That's like, I'll, I'll say from the very like get-go here, because I, I think like I admire deeply that how you can actually sort of see it frontally and actually say something like so powerfully, right? Um, so let's see, maybe sort of speak more about your experience of working. I mean, I think you did address some of the challenges, but maybe sort of address some of the challenges that as you kind of face the public, like internal struggles versus actually like how the work gets perceived or your family, your close friends to sort of more social, like larger groups and the way that it's perceived. I mean, does that matter to you that how, let's see, art critics talk about anything or how society actually start talking about this? What's, uh, so yeah, I, I think there is a personal struggle that you can talk about, but there is also how it's received, how it's, uh, I mean, whether it matters to you or not and why who wants to sort of start okay i'll i'll, I'll go uh, well when i was making work i actually didn't think uh, about the display at all you know i had certain uh. questions that i had in my mind and it was more about express expressing myself i think uh, but when we, we when we showed the work, uh, it was much later. I was already I had already started working on it, um, and then when it was put out, of course, you can never tell how uh, people would react to the work, right? Um, but it was um, it was a great it was a great learning experience. Also, like you know, in a way, you're putting yourself out there and then wondering. Oh my God! What have I just done? Uh, but at the same time, when you hear people uh, saying, you know, they took their mothers, and fathers, uh, friends, um, uncle, aunt, um, boyfriend, girlfriend to the to the exhibition, then uh, you you feel that probably there are some things that resonated with with people. Um, and this idea of public and private, I always uh, uh, I always uh, it's difficult for me to. Uh, understand actually and navigate. Uh, I hope, uh, yeah, I hope I, uh, I I sort that in my head uh, as I make the work and display the work. Rabit? Hi. Hi. Yes. Um, for me, since I have been trying to cover uh, various topics, and my purpose had been very clear that I want to do a performance on road mostly because I think those are the people who get less chance to interact with art per se. Like I also wanted to bring art out from a gallery to a space where it could actually make some difference to an audience who might not be literate in art, but they are they know how to communicate. So for me, one of the difficult part with the first performance when I was performing in an isolated area in Bangalore. I was like, how should I talk about such a sensitive topic? Because I never wanted to talk about nudity at the first place. Neither I wanted to show the body and the rape word as prominently, mm -hmm. because I think I know I would not able to handle it and any other girl probably might not able to handle it. But I really wanted to create awareness about it that how often we don't listen. like, mm -hmm. And the noise is something which get lost mm -hmm. in isolation. And at the same time, when it's too crowded, you can't hear it. Right. So for me, bringing it through performance was a task. 
and uh, and to my surprise people though they stopped by but they didn't intervene mm -hmm. now i don't know how should i take this because i was hoping that somebody would inter uh, intervene because the word bachao itself is a help thing yeah. they should have probably come and ask me what's happening but they didn't and i was a little disappointed as well because this is how this is how the major issues around in society get lost oh wow so people saw you making the bachao like nobody actually stopped by to ask mm. anything yeah nobody and 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 that's also makes me curious that if mm -hmm. i take the performance in a crowded street mm -hmm. and if i write in the language maybe in the kannada and not in hindi what would people react to do they really bother and this is a big question for us to really contemplate on how much do we bother about the issues that happen around us same with the performance which i um, did with the adjustment yeah. people were fascinated oh women are logged they were like oh why they are logged are they insane what what's happening they were a little curious but they i could see they like few of them stopped by and few of them just you know didn't care but then again they didn't care because maybe we were women inside a box and it's like it's okay it's normal you know that's fine so nobody tried to come and like open the no no they didn't <laughs> and... i saw some, someone actually taking photograph was that uh in that yeah, so i think they were just trying to understand and maybe since there was a camera but uh, i think one woman maybe later once we did the performance she asked me what were you doing and what it's all about but I think these are the natural things that happens, and that is beyond an artist's control. And I think that's that's why I probably find the medium very strong because you are in public, you don't know how would they react to it, and there starts a new conversation altogether. And like this had been my approach so far, and each day when I think more about it, I think it's I'm improvising and understanding the language, which is. more accepted by the society i think this was also one of the major learning i had through the program uh, last year when we were online mm -hmm. the uh, program and nora mentioned about the languages and art and i think we, this this was one of my major takeaway that do we really need to speak in the language which is more accepted by the society mm -hmm. i'm not saying that i should alter my piece altogether for the society but i think giving that a priority also makes so much sense when we really want to create a difference Okay, I'm already getting questions, so I'm going to um, also sort of try to channel them as I ask you questions. So one of the things that uh, I think Snail Snail also mentioned this. So is it? Do you think working as woman artists, both of you um, in South Asia, uh, do you think the ability to to express yourself as woman artists actually differ by class and caste? I think uh, both of you kind of are aware of this uh, and. address in your work as well but so do you think you can do these works partly kind of defined by your social background class and caste do, do they actually determine or enable you to be able to express yourself better or more openly than not or does it not matter thought bunu video yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think it definitely matters that we speak the language that we do. Uh, the kind of education we've had mm -hmm. uh, definitely uh, is a privilege that I think I have. Sorry, not we. I I I speak from my myself, and coming from upper caste. Though upper caste women are, you know, um, in Nepal, um, there's more policing around. Uh, Mm -hmm. um around our body and experiences depending on of course it depends on family to family but i would definitely uh, uh, acknowledge the privilege that i have yes i'm very aware of it i think for me it had been a little hesitation not because i obviously because me being a woman and standing in a space which alters the composition and a conversation around that space in all the performance i think i have come across a hesitation in the beginning because people would if not they would not accept it but they, there is also some kind of uh, repulsion or something which is like not as conducive as i should have a performer 
but I would say it's only the initial hesitation. Then it goes away, and then I feel much comfortable. And it has nothing to do with the background I belong to, but I think it has more to do with me being a woman. Hmm. So I guess uh, there. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, it's trying to sort of um, talk a little bit more about this, like women in South Asia, expectations, burdens, and obligations is like how we subtitled the, the exhibition. And I think we do get a sense of, sort of all these expectations and burdens. And I wonder, the speaking of obligations, I wonder if you can actually sort of think about yourselves as artists, women artists, and do you actually, not as just thinking about women in South Asia as uh, having sort of these parochial societies ex expectations and obligations to fulfill, but as women artists, do you feel kind of an, an obligation to the society or for future generation or what have you, or probably in your case for your sons, I guess, you really do have that motivation as well, I, I think. Uh, can you sort of talk a little bit more about what drives you in terms of how you see yourself and your work actually pro progressing? I think, yeah, like you were, you are right. Like for me, my perspective shifted from seeing my future per se, then seeing my kids' future. I'm like, okay, now whatever I do, however I do, it has to have something that would benefit to some extent to my kids. And that had been the major shift that happened in past five years. Um, and all the series which I have done so far and the one I'm doing it, they have a basic uh, cause and the source. Like for example, as you said, for when I, when I came up with the series of I'm more than a reflection of my mother, many people were offended. They were like, how can you say that you're more than the reflection of your mother, you know? like. I have a good mother and I wouldn't want to say that. And I, and I meant that I want to say that you're more than a reflection of her. And that is how each generation progresses. And mother being also a metaphor for the origin of something. And mm -hmm. as you progress, it's it's a kind of evolution. So I'm not saying that you know, mother being, I'm de not demeaning the value of mother, but what I want to say that with each generation, we are a lot more than what we have been born in a way. And that comes from my daughter experience where she's expected to be a good painter, where each time people say that, oh, your mom is an artist and you should be an artist, while she don't want to be an artist at the first place. And so I believe that this identity crisis doesn't germinate out in the society first, but it happens back at the home, mm -hmm. in the atmosphere where kids are expected to do something just mm -hmm. because their parents had done something. And yeah, this yeah. is how it has been actually progressing. No, yeah. no, I, I mean, it, it, it's quite clear from your work, uh, actually. And, and I, I'm glad that you kind of explained like what you meant by I'm not a well, reflection of my mother. Like, I think that's actually, I didn't realize how powerful that actually is. Yes. Uh, Buna, you, you want to kind of think together? Uh, oh, yeah. Hmm. Obligation is, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to how to put that, but I, I feel, uh, I think it's important uh, as women artists, as artists, to, to be able to say the things that we want to say and we need to say. Uh, and uh, I, I feel I was always looking for a language, you know, uh, I sometimes struggle to put things into words or, you know, it takes a while. But when I found photography and uh, I thought I should start expressing myself and also, um, maybe my niece won't like it later when she grows up but you know when she was born there was certain kind of feeling that I was going through and uh, you know being a being a woman uh, but uh, yeah in a way I don't know if that's an obligation but I think it's important to to do that uh, as women because I think we should talk about these things. No, I'm, I'm sort of moved that you your work actually, people go see with their family members and actually, you know, creating a public discourse around the topic of women's body that's actually hush hush and mm -hmm. like nobody likes to talk about or it's kept in shame and or it's just a very private and I, I understand why you talk about public private 
as something of a dilemma or something of a an issue too. And I think that might be specific to being a woman, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I remember when uh, we were showing the work, it was in a community and it was in a temple and I had to go and talk to the women's group and they looked at the photographs and they were like, okay, can we remove some of the photos? And then I asked them, why should we remove? Uh, and uh, they were like, no, the men will get offended uh, by these photographs. Uh, and then I said, for how long are we going to please uh, men, you know, in a way? And I think um, maybe sometimes I feel I forced my way in, which that's the dilemma I think I feel, um, to be very honest. Like, did I force myself on, uh, on people, you know, just like, look at this. So, I think, yeah, also, and it, it is about being a woman, right? You're always sort of, like, even now, how much I monitor myself, you know, we, you know, what am I saying and am I, so it's, yeah, I think, yeah, how much of it do you want to put it out in the public? But, yeah, I, I guess it's just not about me anymore. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think when you create, a, like, work that's going to be shared with the world, it's no longer about yourself, but yeah. really communicating with the world and actually expressing really strongly about what you see in the world and you know and I think it's really I think both of you kind of are wanting to make some changes in people's way of seeing and way of sort of thinking about the world in a gendered way that's not like very difficult being a woman actually right uh, I I guess I also sympathize strongly being a woman myself. So, um, okay, I will sort of try to get more. I, I, we do have a lot, quite a number of uh, questions. Okay. Uh, I think there is a question for Bunu. What is your photography workflow? What photographers in inspire you? And how do you decide upon the topics you explore? Uh, do you have a community you present and get feedback from? So I think this is like related to your process of work uh, that uh, yes. they're asking. Mm. Well, my workflow in a way when I, I start doing something and then I do it obsessively for some time and then I just uh, can't do it anymore, I believe. Uh, but yes, I, I do. we do have a very thriving community of photographers in Nepal that we share our work with. Uh, so, uh, and my, wh what was the other question? The, who are so, the photographers? Yeah, are? yeah no, so you have a community. How do you decide upon the topics you would like to explore? Yeah, so I think uh, when I was, uh, uh, I had lived in India for a very long time and then I, you know, I would ask myself, why do I live in India? And I realized that actually Nepal suffocates me, so I am running away, you know, in a way to some some other place so I don't have to be there uh, and when I when I came back eventually in uh, 2016 and 17 early and I started you know doing some work and that's when I, I met up with one of the women and then we were talking and we started making work so one thing led to the other rather than me deciding okay this is what I'm going to now make you know uh, but I was I was quite conscious that I wanted to tell stories of women and that I was very clear about. Uh, but other things I don't uh, decide like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. I think same question we can ask Pragati, but I think there is another question about sort of your process. I think I'm going to convey this question first. So in both cases, the camera was very present and the performative nature of the performance was very palpable. So the um, one of the audience, mem audience members is curious how um, you navigate permission with your collaborators. And also there is, um, given that there is a silencing overbearing aspect of patriarchy that doesn't necessarily seek permission. So how does one counter it and develop one's method? And I think this is, especially probably your work with the sort of that um, with the box and in the and other women in there, you, and being in the, on the in the middle of the street, I was wondering like how you actually managed to do that uh, to begin with. Are you seeking permission, or you know, so maybe you can explain your sort of process as well. Yeah. So uh, because of the 
current distress, not only because with the COVID, but also in general, people are, I think, a little more sensitive in the recent times. So I make, I usually make sure that I should take a permission from the local police there, because if I'm doing anything on the public space, it might interrupt the traffic. That's like one of the primary thing. Otherwise, if any, if it's not something that would make any religious or any comment affecting the sentiments of certain section of a society, I think I'm good to go. So when I went uh, into a police station, I was asked, does it, you know, um, talk about certain community? What do you want to do? Is it safe? And I was like, no, I just want to talk about, I just want to initiate a conversation around uh, my topic, which is so-and-so. And it doesn't offend anybody's sentiment as such, other than maybe the women and maybe the male. And, and they were like, okay. And with all the performances, I think it was purely a difficult time to deal with the gaze, to deal with how people see, how people look at you. I think that sometimes really make you uncomfortable but that also become a part of your performance because we don't know how would you react and the anxiety and the nervousness and the confidence, everything reflects. And that's how even silently when you're not talking, the conversation begins. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Oh. Well, I guess I will read out like two more questions. I, I don't think we have a lot of time. So there is a, I mean, there is like a really appreciation of both presentations, how they're moving and giving an insight into uh, the artist's personal experience of being a woman. And, and uh, this, I think this is a comment from Mina Hewitt, our um, executive director emerita. <laughs> so uh, she's thanks, thank you for sharing yourself so openly. So she asks, oh, when Bunu, you returned to the work of seeing yourself in 2020 from her, your previous studies in 2017, uh, what changes did you see in yourself? What would uh, you attribute this change to? Was uh, it your renewed connection to your mother? Do you actually notice anything different when you, since you're documenting over time? And it, add to that, like how long do you think you'll continue with this? <laughs> it's a saga, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, personally, in me, uh, I, I, I think um, in, in between, it was really a struggle for me, actually, you know, like, uh, why would I want to put myself like this out in the world? And I, I was struggling uh, a, a bit with it, definitely. But I think personally, I, I feel, you know, my idea was to be this really fearless in a way, like, like photography sort of allowed me that space, you know, to be angry, to be, uh, to be this like whatever I was carrying inside of me. I think it allowed me to do that. And and now in 2020, with my mother, of course, we have um, we we've, we've come a long way, you know, along with the work. I think uh, in the beginning she was very reluctant. Uh, she just didn't know what I was doing. And then when she came to the exhibition, she's like, you, everybody is going to see, you know, for, for us in Nepal, what will people say is something very, you know, important in a way. And for my mother, it was difficult to, to also navigate. But now she understands. And we've been having these conversations like, uh, yeah, like, for instance, now she doesn't keep telling me get married, you know, you know, and she's like, it's, but she still wants me to have a partner though. But I'm just saying, you know, I think that's like, a, because every time for her, that was one of the things like, why aren't you married? You know, and uh, yeah, I, I feel more, more, I think I'm getting more confident about mm -hmm. um, and, and being more brave actually than when I was in 2017. Uh, I think there's more room to explore and question and work on. And I don't know for how long. I think sometimes I should just stop it <laughs> and move to something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, but self-portrait, I think it's something of a, of a, a, a method that yeah. you can actually experiment with like for a long period of time. Like, yeah. you know, that's what a lot of master artists in like Western art canon did, like self-portrait. <laughs> and 
you know, you can experience for a long time and you can do other things, but can come back to it anytime you want. Then that would be quite a interesting sort of experiment to see across, I don't know, like many, many years, uh, I hope. Um, anyways, and I, I think one of the questions that I didn't actually get to ask, this is from Marty Chen. Uh, and I think this question comes from really thinking about today's climate uh, in South Asia. So do you think it is getting harder or easier for you and other women in South Asia to express yourselves in current, I guess, climate of political climate, let's say? Or does it not impact? Pravati, you want to go first, especially in India right now? I think it has become more uh, conducive than earlier days, I would say. And especially in the place where I'm living, I think Bangalore is much more progressive city compared to other cities I have come across and I've lived. Um, there people are more adaptive to experiment and without intervening much about it. So I think it's totally a good time for not only women artists, but for any artist to bring up their work. I think it's good. And I think Instagram and Facebook, and there are so many channels, various channels to talk about your work, which is all adding up to and building up a new language, new platform to talk about. It's really a good time. Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good time in a way right now with what's happening for me too. But I, I sometimes, uh, I get this a lot, like it's too private, you know? Uh, so that I get get quite a bit. Mm. Uh, the response. That, yes, yes. That you're sharing too private. Yes, and it's, it's, making people uncomfortable. Yes, yeah, it's too private, and uh, so you know sometimes uh, I get that as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I uh, yeah, I, I think it's by being too private and being uncomfortable. I think you challenge people to yeah. think again and and. And, and think uh, differently. I think that's actually quite uh, important. And yeah, I, I think, yeah, I mean, the, what, the, what you're saying, Pargati, about sort of Bangalore being a sort of progressive space, I wonder if that actually applies to everywhere or, or is just like, like, you think it's actually specific to the city? I think it's specific to city because like if I go to my hometown per se, there is uh, there's only one art gallery, only one art college. Uh, white people are not used to seeing the artwork. So art literacy, I would say it's very low there. If you want to make a statement without art, you can probably do that. But when it comes to art, I think, um, and even if it comes to women expressing and talking about something, I think there is some kind of hindrance there. I strongly believe that Bombay, Delhi, uh, Bangalore has more uh, acceptance. And okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, I guess social media platform actually kind of makes it possible. So, have you actually shared this work that you have done with the Pachao and and others on social media as well, or have you? Yeah. I'm very thankful to you for bringing this topic because uh, in 2020, in the beginning, I was in this phase where should I wait for the gallery to reopen and show my work then after two years? What should I do? Though whatever the topics I have been researching about then, I wanted to talk about it in public. Mm -hmm. And there was this thing when COVID just hit, galleries were shut down. So I was in actual dilemma. What should mm -hmm. I do? Should I wait? Right. And then I was speaking to one of my friends and he was like, are you an activist or are you an artist? Um, and he was like, why I can't be both? Yeah. And then I was like, yeah, I think I don't want to wait for a gallery to reopen because I really need to cover the mass around here. Mm -hmm. And whatever the people who participate and I collaborated with, especially with the series, or like I'm more than my name, yeah. there were more than hundreds of people. And it was something which I never experienced before. When I was talking to them, I realized it is not only art. It is something which has to be more induced and more uh, freely talk about. Like I was like, people were hesitant to even uh, write something on their body. And each time 
I, I had to converse with them and I need to explain them. And then I was like, are you comfortable? And surprisingly, people were comfortable too. But then I have to segregate among those people and speak to them each time. Safdia, the one uh, who wears hijab and hers is the last photograph in the series. And, I, and she's a Muslim girl. And I was like, are you comfortable, Safdia? Because I really don't want you to be, you know, um, get into any conflict. And mm -hmm. she's like, no, I'm, I'm completely fine. I am more than my religion and I want to join Google in future and I'm a really ambitious person and I want to create a difference. So these kind of things happen when you actually interact with people. Mm -hmm. And I was and there I realized, no, I think I can be both. I can be an artist, an activist, and I don't have to limit myself to a gallery uh, space. And that's how it expanded. Beautiful, beautiful. I, I think you, you guys, you both, you ladies, uh, both shared something really powerful. And I, I think uh, our time is up. I'm told. Is it? Is that? Is that true? Already? Oh, <laughs> okay. Our time is up. So I think we'll have to say good good night uh, today. But I hope to see you uh, both uh, on campus soon. And. And thank you all for joining us and for all your questions. And I hope uh, you, if you can uh, come to Cambridge uh, Lakshmital's office, it's uh, this on display, art is on display on the fourth floor. So please come uh, look at them uh, yourselves. Okay. All right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.